Welcome back. For centuries, China has held together a geographically vast, multicultural and multi-ethnic nation, but the Uyghur and Han Chinese riots of this week violently brought to the surface a simmering tension in the country. To discuss the issue, we have Nuri Tukel, a Uyghur American attorney. He's also co-founder of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. And also Walter Lerman, director of the Heritage Foundation's Asia, uh, Asian Studies Center. He's worked extensively in Asia, serving as the executive director of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. Now, before we get to our discussion, here's the result of our Chatram poll. Before the uh, break, we asked, is control of natural resources in Xinjiang province a key reason for the conflict between the Han Chinese and Uyghur minority in the region? Well, 77% of you said yes, while 23% of you said no. Of course, remember, you have to remember this uh, poll is not scientific, but simply the opinion of some of our uh, of viewers around the world. As we get back to questions, we've got a caller on the line. Fahim is on the line from the UK. Fahim, what would you like to ask? Uh, hi. Um, I've got a comment on uh, Nuri's uh, statement. He said the freedom for the Muslims in China has gone towards worse. I think uh, he's uh, not uh, uh, seeing the reality. I've been to China last year. I stayed there for two months and I've seen mosques in China. Muslims are going there. Muslims from all around the world, they are doing business. Uh, so they have got greater freedom. The next freedom is they have like other normal Chinese would have uh, one or two children. And I've seen the Chinese, they uh, are being uh, penalized for the second child. But the Muslim Chinese, they have got even four or five children. They come in, they've got restaurants, they are doing business. Okay. And, and they are enjoying the greater uh, Fahim, freedom. Fahim, let me ask you. Question is, sorry. Go on. Uh, sorry, the question is uh, why the rest of the world is uh, moving towards, you know, regionalization or so making, you know, groups of uh, countries. Why the Uyghurs are, you know, going to a separatism? They are going against the flow, like Europe, like in America, like okay. in Africa. The, the other countries are trying, trying to get together and make like a regional. Uh, All right, um, Fahim, I'm going uh, uh, to ask. I'm going to ask Nuri to to address that then. I appreciate that uh, mm. comment and question. Uh, first of all, it is true in the 80s uh, during the Huyo Bang's presidency, the Chinese government allowed uh, lots of mosques to be built. And the question now becomes, yes, we have that infrastructure. Now, do the people have a right to go in there and practice? That's a fundamental question. And another uh, issue that must be addressed is the Chinese government's religious policy towards the Uyghurs are much, much harsh than the Hui Muslims, per se. Because the Chinese government believed the Uyghurs' religious identity is a feeding tube to the Uyghurs' national identity. That is translated into separatistic tendencies in the waves of the Chinese government. Is that because of Turkic, Turkic origins? Oh, Turkic origin, Islamic values, uh, and long history of being politically aware of the situation okay. in the region. Uh, to answer the second part of the, uh, the, the question about the separatism, the Uyghur people have tried to live within the system. Uh, a colleague here mentioned Ms. Kadir. She is a typical example. She made a millions and become a very powerful individual within the China system, tried to live within the system, tried to promote the cultural rights of the Uyghur people, and the Chinese government view her as an enemy instead of as part of the solution. The, a lot of Uyghurs try that. And also, we don't have a good example. Look at the Dalai Lama. He right. even offered to live within the communist system, and the Chinese government is not taking him seriously. So in order for the Uyghurs to belay, believe that they can better off in China, one, the Chinese government needs to show a goodwill, that they be treated just like anybody else. B, there should be, should be an example uh, elsewhere that they can follow. Okay. There's nothing that makes the Uyghurs to believe they are better off in China. So a lot of people looking the independence or separatism as a way to solve their ethnic issues. The, on that issue of uh, the separatism taking place in China, Fahim's question, uh, Walter, if I could put this to you, it's coming from uh, our chat room, and David in the U.S. here is in the live station chat room, says, is it possible that China would be a federation of semi-independent states in the future as more and more ethnic and religious groups seek autonomy? Uh, I think not a chance. <laughs> They've tried that once and it devolved into uh, warlordism, so uh, I, I don't think that, that, uh, that that's really um, a, a realistic possibility. How do you, how, Walter, how do you assess the, the way that the, the U.S. has been relatively quiet on this? I mean, it, it's, it seems very selective in its condemnation of what's going on where. Yeah. I, I think that's a very good point. I, I think um, less being selective than that they have not decided that they are going to elevate issues of human rights uh, 
um, on their foreign policy agenda. I mean, it's, it's hard not to see it that way. When Hillary Clinton went to China earlier this year, she even said something to the effect that, well, we can't allow these human rights issues to get in the way. Uh, and I think she's making a terrible mistake. They have to be high on the agenda. You can raise these issues with the Chinese, and they're not going to scuttle the whole thing. You can raise these, right. and we, if we don't raise it, who's going to raise is it? Is it fear of the economic power of China? Is that what it is? Uh, you know, it's hard to know. I mean, if, if that's the case, I think they have a fundamental fundamental misreading of the economic situation. The Chinese depend on us as much as we depend on them, and they buy our bonds because they're good investments, um, uh, and they're, they're not going to stop buying them until they become bad investments. Nuri, we had a question from our chat room, live station chat room from Marston in the USA as well, who says, how does the recent release of Uyghur prisoners from Gitmo, from Guantanamo Bay, affect America's stance towards the Uyghur pl uh, plight? The American, uh, American government's handling, uh, particularly politicians and the uh, uh, conservative uh, part of the political uh, spectrum, has been largely disappointing because they effectively blocked the Uyghurs' release into the United States, some of them even equating them with some uh, radical and extreme people, which is false. Even our courts, federal courts, even the Bush administration uh, have cleared that for us already. So there's a big mistake in the U.S. government's uh, part, not even bringing some of them in here. That could have sent some positive message to the Uyghurs back home that the Uyghurs are not alone. But the mistake has already been done, but we expect the U.S. government to uh, handle the rest of the 13 Uyghurs' uh, release uh, proper, appropriately. And uh, I'd like to add one point to uh, Walter's earlier comment about the U.S. response, which has been largely disappointing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been hearing, the Uyghur Americans and the w worldwide Uyghur community have been hearing in previous administration, current administration, so long as you peacefully demand your rights, we're with you. I, the Uyghurs haven't seen that. The Uyghurs simply uh, begging for the type of support that the Iranians on the streets not too long ago asked for the United States, others to show. And it, it has been largely disappointing. Only one government, the Turkish government, have shown right, yeah. very strong uh, sympathy. That's, that's been an interesting plausible. thing, yeah, that, that Turkey has been one of the few countries, yeah. or pretty much the only country that's spoken up. And, and uh, in fact, it's, and a question that came from Facebook, from our Facebook site, from Lilia Patterson, a regular viewer who wrote in, Walter, if you could address this, is China is copying the West using Islamic groups in order to target people and deny them human rights as citizens of Chinese, uh, of China, I guess, uh, regardless of religious persuasion. So, I, I, you know, what bearing do you feel that uh, the, the whole Muslim factor mm -hmm. has on this? And how much of an excuse is that? Well, uh, well, it is principally an excuse. I mean, this, this doesn't really have anything to do with religion um, and that's why I think you see the Turks coming out about it before anyone else or more loudly than anyone else because it's an ethnic issue it's not a religious issue the Chinese are trying to plug into something that they think will sell in the West and the United States in particular if I, if I could just uh, clarify one point that Nuri made I think uh, being from the Heritage Foundation of course I, I wouldn't say that's mostly conservatives objecting to this uh, this policy which is political grandstanding no doubt but it has been pretty equally shared on both sides of the of the aisle mm -hmm. well what alternatives uh, if looking at what's happened on the streets in uh, Xinjiang what alternatives do you think Chinese government has in how it handles the immediate issue of, of demonstrations well I think there's there's several versions of this story that are coming out that have the Chinese handling the Chinese forces handling of the initial demonstrations um, as being the thing that caused it to break out. Uh, so you had peaceful demonstrations, and those demonstrations were turned into something not so peaceful when the Chinese uh, security forces got involved. I mean, once people start rioting, um, yeah, you know, within some restraints, uh, you have to set order straight. But I think you have to look back and see how they started in the first place. Okay. Anyway, let's, yeah. let's look at the, how the Uyghurs started this time. Now, today, it's disturbing that the Chinese uh, government calling them even terrorists. Uh, when this started on Sunday afternoon, I've seen images of the Uyghur uh, youth carrying a Chinese flag. Let me I emphasize this very clearly. It takes a lot to make Uyghurs to carry a Chinese uh, red flag. But they did that uh, hoping that they can be protected within the Chinese system. Mm -hmm. And that shows, that speaks volume that they don't have any tendency to turn it, turn it into a violent incident. If the government is not overreacting, if the government did not shot, uh, fire shotguns, I think it could, the whole thing could have been avoided. Nuri, it suggests when you're saying it takes a lot for a Uyghur to carry a Chinese flag, that suggests that the, 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 the fracture is very, very deep-seated. I mean, the fact that the Uyghurs feel so strongly about even the idea of carrying a Chinese flag. Sounds like there's a lot of, uh, a large gap to be, to be bridged here. I, it, it's an excellent question. There is a reason. Here's a reason why the Uyghurs uh, don't really care. 
about Chinese like that much. The Uyghurs are deeply uh, spiritual people. They enjoy their uh, spirituality, their cultural values. They think that communism does not go in hand with the Uyghurs' uh, right. ordinary way of life. So much, much of it has to do with the Uyghurs don't care much for communism. Well, I have to stop you there. There's so much more to ask you, and I'm sure we'll revisit this, but I thank you both for joining us. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Remember, you can find podcasts of our shows on iTunes. This week, you can hear our discussion on U.S. President Barack Obama's upcoming visit to Africa. If you have a question or comment about show topics you'd like us to cover, you can always email us at riz at aljazeera.net. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.